Ben, thanks for being here and having me this week. I've had a really nice visit uh, and getting to know you all and hearing about what you've been up to. Um, so like Laura mentioned, I'm going to today focus on this uh, result that came out almost exactly a year ago, uh, claiming a detection of the global 21 centimeter signal from high redshift. So if you've never heard of this before, don't worry. I'm going to go into the details in just a minute. Um, so the basic outline of my talk uh, is just, I'll spend about a third of the time discussing this, this so-called global 21 centimeter signal in, in a kind of edges agnostic way, talk about what it potentially tells us about astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and what we'll find in doing that is that the expectations uh, all kind of miss the mark. Um, and there's an amplitude problem of sorts that has led to all sorts of crazy theoretical ideas about what could be causing this. Um, and so I'll spend a lot of the time talking about, in a, in a very general way, um, the flurry of ideas that have come out in the last year to try to explain this signal. And then I'll get into what I actually work on, which is the galaxies piece of this puzzle, um, and ask, you know, are we learning something potentially new about galaxy formation here as well if this signal is in fact astrophysical? And if there's time, I'll maybe speculate a little bit about uh, the extent to which this observation or future observations could marginalize out the astrophysics to learn something about fundamental physics in the early universe. Okay, so the 21 centimeter uh, literature goes back a little over 20 years now um, in a series of papers by Pierre Medal uh, and Shaver et al. And so before I get into the, the 21 centimeter stuff, it's worth just asking why study the early universe in general. So I'll be focusing on the first billion years. Um, and the reason for that is basically that's about the amount of time it takes the intergalactic medium to become reionized. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a cartoon picture of structure formation in the universe, starting with the microwave background all the way on the left, um, and then structure for formation proceeding sort of logarithmically in time, so it inflates how important our epoch of interest looks relative to the current Hubble time. Um, so this is only about 10% of the current age of the universe, but a lot of interesting stuff happens in this time. So what you're seeing here are first stars and galaxies lighting up. These are these little specks of light. Um, and while individually faint, um, they're incredibly numerous, um, and their ultraviolet emissions carve out these huge ionized bubbles around the first stars and galaxies. So the individual sources themselves are faint, but they, they have a big impact uh, on the intergalactic medium. Um, so we can potentially use the intergalactic medium to study them. And, and so you might have your own reasons for why uh, studying this epoch is interesting. For me, it boils down to a few main things. Um, it's a nice test bed for models of star formation and feedback that we sort of think we understand from uh, observations nearby or relatively nearby. Um, as we dial back the clock, we're approaching sort of more and more ideal circumstances, chemically, dynamically, and so forth. Um, that being said, there's the potential for completely new physics. As we go down to very low metallicities, we expect all sorts of strange things to start happening, potentially very massive stars and a slew of feedback processes associated with those stars that don't really exist today. Um, and finally, this lurking in this epoch somewhere is potentially, are, are potentially answers to longstanding problems, like how do you form supermassive black holes in only a billion years? Okay, so there are a lot of interesting puzzles um, uh, to figure out during this epoch. And so you might ask why target the IGM itself? I've already said that you know, while the sources themselves are individually faint, their impact on the IGM is large. Um, but there are, are other reasons um, uh, to target the IGM via 21 centimeter emission. All right, so unlike galaxy surveys, which are going to be more biased to very bright sources at uh, great distances, uh, the 21 centimeter approach uh, doesn't suffer from this weakness. So it's, it's in principle sensitive to all the sources, so you don't have this bias. But of course, then you're left with this problem of learning about, trying to learn about individual sources from sort of their aggregate impact on the IGM. So you win some, you lose some. Um, it's also, it also opens up a region of uh, source spectra that we can't typically access. Okay, so sort of by definition, uh, the, the fact that these bubbles are forming from ultraviolet photons, uh, ionizing the gas in the vicinity of galaxies, we're not seeing those UV photons, which tell us a lot about how massive stars are forming over time. So if we can piece together this patchwork of bubbles, uh, we're learning something about UV emission. Um, and this isn't a new idea. You're probably familiar with trying to learn about galaxy formation from the ionization history. So you can do this by looking at the optical depth to the microwave background, which tells you something about the integrated electron column density along the line of sight. So that's a crude 
uh, way to constrain the ionization history. So the 21 centimeter background is sensitive to that, uh, but it's also sensitive to the temperature of the gas. Okay? So we're sensitive both to this patchwork of bubbles, but then also the temperature of the gas between the bubbles, uh, which is basically set by the uh, prevalence of sources with harder spectra. Okay, so anything that accretes and produces x-rays, those x-rays will kind of pervade the medium and heat the gas on large scales. Okay, so we have, in principle, access to those kinds of objects as well. Um, and if we can come up with a model for galaxy formation where we can simultaneously model galaxies and uh, couple their radiation to the IGM in a self-consistent way, then we've basically just constructed a null test for our model. Right? If we can go in and look at the properties of the IGM, if those don't jive with our predictions, we're learning something new um, that wasn't in our models before. Okay, so I've, I've said 21 centimeter a lot already and I haven't really defined what we're talking about. So just to make sure we're all on the same page going forward, the, the 21 centimeter background is generated by rest frame 21 centimeter emission uh, from hydrogen atoms, neutral hydrogen atoms, okay? Uh, so the ground state of the hydrogen atom is split and this splitting corresponds to a small energy difference uh, corresponding to a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Um, and so a quantity that will keep coming up again and again in this talk is the spin temperature. And so the spin temperature is just an excitation temperature with a special name because we're uh, talking about this spin flip transition in hydrogen. And it's not necessarily a kinetic temperature, okay? And I'll get into that more in a second. Um, it's an excitation temperature, right? It's just a, it's a way of quantifying the relative level populations of hydrogen atoms. Um, so it depends on things uh, that are pretty intuitive, right? So if you think about uh, the relative uh, level populations in these atoms, that can be set by collisions uh, between hydrogen atoms or free electrons. So it depends in general on the density. Uh, again, uh, because collisions can be important, it depends on the temperature. Um, but in cases where uh, the, the medium is very low density and collisions are unimportant for mediating these level populations, uh, the thing that matters is uh, whatever radiation background is around. Okay. So we generally think that's the CMB, uh, T gamma, um, uh, or this quantity J alpha, which quantifies uh, the intensity of the Lyman alpha background. So that's less obvious uh, why this quantity would matter, um, but I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Um, so observationally what's going on in, is essentially a 1D radiative transfer problem. All right, we've got a backlight, which we generally think is the CMB. We've got some absorber, which is H1 in the early universe, and then some detector on the ground like edges, uh, though there are many other experiments that you know, don't necessarily look like edges. Um, and the thing that we try to measure is the so-called differential brightness temperature. So this is just uh, the, the brightness temperature of hydrogen gas relative to the CMB. And again, there are a few intuitive uh, dependences here. So you'll notice this uh, leading factor of the neutral fraction. This makes sense. Uh, if some cloud of hydrogen along our line of sight is fully ionized, it'll be transparent to 21 centimeter radiation. And so we just see straight to the CMB, uh, which corresponds to a signal of zero. In general, this depends on the density. Uh, you know, denser stuff emits more strongly. Um, but I'm going to be talking about sky average measurements which probe the cosmic mean density. So delta is going to be zero for this whole talk. Uh, this isn't the case uh, for uh, experiments targeting fluctuations in this background. There's a mild redshift dependence and then the spin temperature I just introduced comes up in the last term. This is extremely important. So what you'll notice about this term is that if the spin temperature is small relative to the CMB, this last term becomes negative. So there's an absorption signal and it can be potentially very large. All right. However, if the spin temperature is large relative to the CMB, this final term uh, goes away. This quantity in parentheses tends to one, and we are left with a signal of order 30 millikelvin with a small redshift dependence. Okay, so for, for a long time, there's a nice argument in here, which is if you think the spin temperature becomes large very early on, uh, and you're interested in reionization, you can measure this brightness temperature and read off the ionization history as a function of time, which is pretty cool. All right. um, however, if that's not the case, then you have to disentangle the effects of ionization uh, and temperature, uh, which can be tricky. Right. So up until a year ago, that's where I would have stopped with this slide. But I have to make uh, one slight generalization that will be helpful later. So as I said, this is a 1D radio transfer problem. You've got a backlight, an absorber, a detector. Uh, we generally think we know what that backlight is pretty well. Um, 
But for reasons I will soon outline, <laughs> uh, one appealing solution is to replace TCMB with some more generic radiation background temperature. All right. Uh, and we'll come back to why that is in just a second. So to build some intuition for this problem, I think it's useful to consider a universe where astrophysics never happens. Okay, no stars, no galaxies, no black holes. Just got a huge chunk of, let's call it IGM, even though there, there are no Gs in this model. Um, and it's got the cosmic mean density, it's expanding with the Hubble flow, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm showing you here is a, a three quantities uh, where this evolution is playing out. The top one is probably familiar. This is cosmological recombination, so redshift 1100. Uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the gas goes from being fully ionized uh, to neutral to a part in 10 to the 4. And while that's happening, the gas is also cooling. Um, but at very early times, the CMB is hot, hotter than it is now, and the gas is denser. And so uh, Thompson scattering between free electrons and photons keep those temperatures tightly coupled together. <laughs> right, so uh, the cooling at early times is following uh, like one plus Z evolution where the CMB and the kinetic temperature share that evolution. But eventually as the universe keeps expanding, uh, the free electron fraction is dropping, uh, the density overall is dropping, the, T the, the CMB is cooling so that Compton scattering is becoming less and less efficient. And eventually the gas can actually cool faster than the CMB. Okay. So we actually expect, uh, starting at a redshift of a few hundred, that the gas is colder than the CMB, which has important implications for 21 centimeter studies. Um, but like I said, the thing that we care about is not necessarily the kinetic, kinetic temperature of the gas, it's the spin temperature. Okay. So the real question is, what is the spin temperature doing throughout these epochs? Um, and once again, uh, something interesting happens as the universe continues to expand. Right. So again, at early times, because the densities are high, collisional coupling can mediate the hyperfine level populations, which once again keeps the spin temperature in equilibrium with the kinetic temperature. So the spin temperature is the same as the gas temperature, which is the same as the CMB temperature at early times. Now, as the universe keeps uh, expanding, the densities go down and that collisional coupling becomes ineffective at a redshift of about a few hundred. Um, uh, sorry, uh, so origin, sorry. The, the collisional coupling fails after uh, Compton scattering fails, which means that initially the spin temperature will follow the kinetic temperature on its descent downward. But then, uh, as the universe continues to expand, those collisions become ineffective, and so the spin temperature will tend back to whatever radiation field is around, which is the CMB. So actually, we expect a feature in the 21 centimeter background, even in the absence of astrophysical sources, which is pretty cool. Um, so if you're paying attention on my uh, title slide, you'll remember that the edges, the edges band is between 50 and 100 megahertz, um, and this predicts a signal at something like 15 megahertz. Um, so you might very reasonably ask, why is there a signal beyond 30 megahertz at all? all right. And so this gets back to this J alpha quantity that I mentioned um, a few slides ago. So it turns out, uh, just due to a quirk in the selection rules of the hydrogen atom, the spontaneous absorption and re-emission of Lyman alpha photons can mix the hyperfine level populations. All right. um, which is pretty important uh, for this whole field. <laughs> Basically what it means is that, um, so, so the IGM is incredibly optically thick to Lyman alpha photons, right? uh, which means a single photon will scatter something like a million times before it redshifts out of the line. So that's a lot of spins that are being flipped. Um, and because it's so optically thick, uh, you can think of this radiation background as kind of being in th thermal equilibrium with the gas temperature. So this is uh, kind of a new mechanism to couple the spin temperature to the kinetic temperature. And what it means is that when the first stars form and flood the universe with UV photons for the first time, those photons either redshift through Lyman alpha or cascade through Lyman alpha after they you know, encounter one of the other Lyman resonances. And through this Foudhausen field mechanism, they couple the spin temperature to the gas temperature which means if you can measure the brightness temperature of H1, you're, you can learn about the, the gas temperature. All right. So the first stars turn on, they tell you what the gas temperature is. Um, just kind of amazing. Okay, so now let's get to the astrophysics part. Um, so this is, once again, uh, a series of models for the global 21 centimeter signal. So we've got brightness temperature on the y-axis in millikelvin, uh, observed frequency on the x-axis, and then the corresponding redshifts on the top. So everything I just showed you is off the, the left-hand part of this plot. So that dark ages 
astrophysics free model is out over here somewhere, and the signal's kind of on its way back to zero as collisions are failing. But then once the first stars form, they flood the, UV, or the IGM with uh, UV photons for the first time, which drives the signal into absorption because the gas is still cooling um, after this Compton scattering became inefficient. But after the first stars form, they probably leave behind remnants, or maybe there's some other exotic channels for forming compact objects which accrete, emit x-rays into the universe on large scales, which, which heats the gas. And so now we're in the situation where the spin temperature is large relative to the CMB. We get an emission signal that saturates. Right? So this is uh, something like 20 millikelvin in this model. And then reionization happens, and that's destroying our signal with time. Right? So we kind of expect these three spectral features to uh, crop up in kind of generically in models of the 21 centimeter background. And so you can ask, you can put together a simple model for galaxy formation where you basically say, let's assume that the star formation rate density is proportional to the rate at which uh, mass is coalescing into dark matter halos uh, with some star formation efficiency. And I can just parameterize the efficiency with which galaxies produce uh, uh, soft UV photons, X-rays, ionizing photons, and then quantify uh, the typical uh, mass of star forming halos through some uh, typical virial temperature. Team in. So I'm going to play a little movie where you just wiggle around uh, the values of these parameters and you can see that the features of the signal move around as well. So the argument that we've been making for a long time is if you go out and you measure the features of the signal, uh, you can learn something in principle about how galaxies work in the early universe. All right, it's pretty cool. Um, so in principle, uh, so that was the, the global 21 centimeter signal. In principle, you can image this background like you can image the CMB. Though now, because we're going after a line, uh, you can, in principle, do that at every redshift, right? So each redshift corresponds to a different observed frequency. And you can do tomography, all right? You can build up a three-dimensional picture of the early universe. Um, but the same series of events is expected to play out uh, in maps as well, though now there's a, a spatial element to the signal. Um, and so you're proceeding from clockwise in this plot from high redshift uh, to low redshift. So initially, stars are forming in dense, cold regions, heating up their surroundings, eventually heating the gas on large scales, and then ionizing the IGM from the inside out. All right, so the, the black part of the color scale on these models is a signal of zero. That's where the, the gas is ionized. Right. Um, and there are experiments targeting these as well. These are interferometric experiments generally. So you could do things like, you know, imaging is kind of the long-term goal. Uh, currently, people are just trying to kind of do power spectra uh, analyses of these things. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, though, I'm going to talk about the global 21 centimeter signal, which is basically just uh, the volume average of boxes like this. All right, any questions about the background? If not... I will delve into what started happening a year ago. All right. So almost exactly a year ago, the Edges Collaboration put out this paper in Nature. And they said, here's an absorption signal centered at 78 megahertz in the sky average spectrum. OK. And the uh, most startling sentence in the opening paragraph is the following. The profile is largely consistent with expectations for the 21 centimeter signal induced by early stars via this Vauthausen field mechanism I mentioned earlier. However, the best fitting amplitude of the profile is more than a factor of two greater than the largest predictions. Okay, so to just give you a sense of what edges looks like, I, I showed it already. Here is that uh, signal. Um, so 78 megahertz corresponds to a redshift of about 18 or uh, nearly 200 million years after the Big Bang. And here now they've shown these signals with uh, the unit uh, on the y-axis in Kelvin rather than millikelvin, which kind of gives away the strength of these signals. And then here is EDGES itself sitting out uh, in Western Australia at the MRO site. Um, so to just orient you a little bit more, I'm going to take those data and uh, translate into a linear frequency axis. So now we're looking at 50 to 100 megahertz. This trough occupies uh, redshift 15 to 20. And now in millikelvin, so um, these, these troughs are of order uh, 500 millikelvin or half a kelvin. Um, so some things to be wary of in this neck of the woods. So the FM radio band sits at the high frequency part of the edges band. Um, in principle, one has to worry about the Earth's own ionosphere, which is uh, 
a source of opacity but also refraction at low frequencies. The, the cutoff is probably down somewhere near 30 megahertz, though it's not really understood that well. Um, and then these very high redshifts, redshifts 15 to 20. So the highest redshift galaxies known uh, right now are something like a redshift of 11. Okay, so let's talk about this factor of two problem. So as I mentioned, um, in kind of a vanilla cosmological model, you have a very clear prediction for what the gas temperature should be as a function of time. Right? Uh, if we know kind of how fast the universe is expanding and we know how Thompson scattering works uh, and our models of recombination are accurate, you can basically know as a function of redshift how cold the IGM can be after recombination. So if you assume that the, the Wauthausen field coupling is strong, you have kind of a, a maximal lower bound on how strong of a 21 centimeter signal you can get as a function of time, which is what uh, this line corresponds to. Right, so in vanilla lamb lambda CDM cosmology, models in this cross-hatched region shouldn't occur. Right. So this is uh, the source of many, many uh, efforts to understand the edges signals that they seem to be sitting in the exact region that they weren't supposed to be. So for the rest of the talk, I am going to lump all these different edges signals into one band and kind of represent it schematically like this, um, uh, and usually in a pretty uh, broad frequency range. So I'm a theorist. Um, I think about trying to explain the signal, but uh, suffice it to say this is a very controversial measurement. Um, so I'm going to spend two slides trying to, to kind of hit the highlights of why this is hard. Um, this is a great way to completely derail the talk. So I'm going to try to synthesize the skepticism of the measurement as quickly as possible and move on and pretend it's real and, you know, uh, all that sort of good stuff. So the main problem for this whole field is that uh, the foreground is very strong. All right, so we have a very weak signal and we have to look out of our own galaxy to see it. So what Grant and Harker did a couple of years ago is he put together this plot and he showed this a, a model for the global 21 centimeter signal, uh, uh, kind of vanilla model. So this is pre-edges. So this has an absorption magnitude of something like 100 millikelvin. And then put it in the context of uh, other foregrounds. So our own galaxy is, is the, the hardest thing to deal with here. Uh, it emits synchrotron radiation at low frequencies, rising towards lower frequencies. And you'll notice that the, the brightness of the galaxy is of order 1,000 kelvin with uh, frequency dependence that goes like nu to the minus 2.5 or so. If you were going to do, as we were thinking about at the time, trying to do this stuff from space, you have to worry about the sun and the moon, uh, which is just a black body here. And then if, even if you're kind of in orbit above the lunar far side, you have to worry about the galaxy reflected off of the moon. And even that is orders of magnitude stronger than the signal. Okay. But the thing you'll notice about all of those curves is that they're very smooth spectrally, right? whereas the signal has spectral features. But then if you look spatially in the sky, it's the exact opposite. Okay, so the foreground has tons of spatial structure, no spectral structure. The signal is the exact opposite. Okay, it has spectral structure on large scales, no spatial structure. Okay, so in principle, you can tease these two things apart from each other if you can simultaneously fit the foreground and the signal. So that's, that's the reason that people are still doing this, that we have hope that it, it's in principle possible. Right. Um, Nonetheless, uh, there have been challenges to the measurement. Um, models for the signal and the foreground uh, and the instrument can be quite complicated. So this is a high dimensional inference problem. And people have pointed it out that um, you, know, you can kind of play around with how you parameterize your instrument in the foreground and the signal and, and get different answers. Uh, there could be foregrounds that we're not generally including like uh, spinning dust in the Milky Way that can give rise to absorption signals. There could be instrumental systematics that give rise to spectral features that look like the signal you're interested in, which is very scary. Right? So even if the foreground is intrinsically perfectly smooth, if your experiment has chromaticity in the beam, you will mix spatial and spectral structure and can potentially kind of inject spectral structure into an otherwise spectrally featureless foreground. Okay. Uh, so Rich Bradley put out a paper discussing how uh, the ground screen sitting on the ground underneath the antenna could give rise to such signals. Okay, so entire talks could be given about any of these topics, so I'm going to try to synthesize the kind of general criticism in one slide. 
And this is my opinion. This isn't the opinion of anyone in Edges or the papers I just referred to. And it's a two-part dialogue. It goes like this. Everyone says it's easy to remove power from the signal by invoking additional complexity in the foreground or the instrument, right? Okay. So I can take those parameters I used to model the signal and I can just stick them in the foreground or the instrument and maybe I can essentially fit out. Like I don't need there to be a signal there. There could just be uh, additional complexity in the foreground of the instrument that I'm not aware of. That, of course, makes a prediction for the properties of the instrument in the foreground. And I think what the edges people would say is that's true in general, but we don't see evidence for any of that sort of complexity. All right. So we're at sort of a standstill, it seems like, but I think it's an exciting time to be thinking about this stuff because there are a lot of people trying to go after this signal independently. And those experiments look uh, nothing like edges. So here's edges again. We have other single dipole experiments like PRISM and Ceres, which have uh, very different designs, as you can see. Um, we have interferometric experiments like HERA, LOFAR, the MWA, eventually SKA, that are going after the fluctuations in this signal. So if the edges signal is real, um, you know, the mean signal is strong, but that scales the fluctuations as well. And so if it's real, HERA or some of these other interferometric experience, uh, experiments should also see stronger than expected signals. So, so recording that, look at one slide, So for example, the spinning dust argument. Uh -huh. yeah. Come on. Yeah. Right. So that's no spatial variable. No, Edges has made no effort to deal with dust. Oh. Nothing. Nothing. Um, nothing explicitly. So, so the edges, so edges has essentially no spatial resolution. All right, so they can't actually do that. They're using, they're trying to disentangle signal from foreground purely in the spectral domain. Um, what people typically do to set expectations for this is they take a model for the foreground, they convolve it with the beam of the experiment, a, a model for the beam of the experiment, and they ask how complicated of a model do I need to fit that out down to, down to some, they're, they're generally like log polynomials or something like that with four to seven terms. And depending on the experiment uh, and how chromatic their beam is, you need fewer or more terms to fit out the experimental effects. Of course, those could be degenerate with the signal as well. So in these idealized experiments where you try to figure out how complicated your beam is, that could get biased later, if, especially if there's a strong signal in there. Um, but that's sort of what sets the expectation for how complicated the, the instrument is, is those, uh, those kinds of techniques. Okay, so let's get to uh, this amplitude problem. So when this result first came out, um, I imagine what people did, this is what I did, is to look at this equation for the 21 centimeter brightness temperature and ask which of these things am I willing to part ways with. All right. All of them are based on pretty reasonable arguments. Okay, CMB is a thing we know about. Uh, as I already said, the spin temperature evolution in a vanilla model is very well understood. We've got some cosmological parameters here that I buried earlier in the normalization factor. And you know, XH1 is between zero and one by definition. That doesn't really help us. So, so how can we make this stronger? So uh, there've been a series of papers exploring uh, the spin temperature term. Uh, one way you can do this is if you assume that baryons and dark matter interact with each other, uh, baryons can use dark matter as a heat sink of sorts, dump some of their energy into the dark matter and cool beyond the, the standard expectation. Um, and so the first series of papers invoked milli-charged dark matter uh, to do this, so dark matter with a very small uh, electric charge. That's not necessarily the only option. Uh, the other term you can lean on is this background temperature term. Okay. So if maybe there's some exotic particle that decays at high redshift, gives rise to a low frequency background that uh, serves to amplify the backlight. Um, maybe very early stars and black holes themselves emit a low frequency background strong enough to amplify a signal beyond uh, our, our kind of generic expectations. You can play with cosmology as well. Um, that's a little trickier, though there are some models where you can kind of play some games with how omega baryon and omega matter evolve at high redshift. Um, though it's not clear that those really work. So I want to go through the first two of these models in a little bit more detail. Okay. So Renan Bercano was the first to arrive at the scene on March 1st of last year and suggested uh, milli-charged dark matter as a plausible candidate to resolve this 
this problem. So nearly charged dark matter has a cross section that goes like velocity to the minus four, which is advantageous in this context. And he basically mapped out this parameter space between particle mass and cross section and noted that you know, in this region of parameter space, you can get uh, 21 centimeter signals that are, are, are stronger uh, than, than the standard uh, models. So basically anything above uh, this dashed contour or the hatched region uh, pro provides a, a kind of net cooling effect. This was quickly revised by Munoz and Loeb, who pointed out that you can't actually give all of the dark matter this quality without breaking other constraints. In this case, having to do with the galactic magnetic field. Um, I'm not going to get into that argument because it was quickly revised again by a slew of other authors who pointed out that actually to avoid running into trouble, um, this is a slightly different parameter space now. This is now particle mass and then epsilon is the charge to mass ratio in units of the electron charge and mass. So the cross section is proportional but not equal to this. And uh, there are constraints from other experiments in this space. Um, from 1987A, the CMB, uh, particle accelerators on the ground. And this black uh, contour denotes the region where you get enough cooling to explain the edges measurement. So you'll notice that if 100% of the dark matter had uh, uh, the properties necessary to give an edges-like signal, uh, it would violate all of the other constraints. If you dial that back to 10%, you're still in trouble. But now for a 1% fractional milli charged dark matter model, there's this little sliver peeking out of the constraints, which is still viable. Right. Okay, so that's what you need to make this work. Um, if you go the, the dark matter interactions route. Um, so the radio background uh, explanation can't be dismissed immediately. It turns out there's a known excess in the low frequency radiation background. So basically if you look at the sky, at, at low frequencies and you try to take out the foreground in a not dissimilar way from what the edges people have to do, uh, you see more than just the CMB. So this was first reported by Arcade 2 um, almost 10 years ago, I think, and more recently uh, published again by the LWA, a completely different experiment on the ground. And so uh, Feng and Holder pointed out that if you took 10% of this background and assumed it originated at very high redshifts, that would be enough uh, to give rise to an edges-like signal. All right. So if even 10% of this is both real and originates at high redshift, maybe this can work. Okay, so it's been an interesting time for an otherwise pretty small field. Um, what's, what's high redshift above 20? Uh, yeah, so it has to be behind the, <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty tough, I'll come back to that. Uh, so if you've been paying attention to the archive, um, there have been a lot of papers about this in the last year. I should have updated this today because there have been a few more in the last week. Um, people have time, had time now to think more deeply about this issue, I think. Uh, and so originally we were going at something like a paper every three days that's uh, leveled out to more like uh, almost a paper per month and uh, on a variety of topics, okay? So if you just look at the charged dark matter papers and the radio background papers, uh, it's only like a third of all the papers that have been published on this topic, you'll notice this big other slice, which is, I'm not a physicist, uh, I see papers and I don't know any of the words in the title, but they have something to do with edges, uh, I've been told. Uh, it is tough to put papers in, in these wedges because uh, they're, they're strongly linked, right? So if you're interested in constraining warm dark matter models, uh, so if, if there were a lot of warm dark matter in the early universe, I suppress structure on small scales that in principle delays uh, the growth of the relevant radiation background, so that has some degeneracy with galaxy formation. If I think that there's some dark uh, component of dark matter that interacts with baryons, that could manifest on small scales as well in collapsing clouds in the early universe, which are of course relevant to this problem. Uh, I could try to generate a radio background with galaxies and early stars and black holes. Um, I could play with cosmology, right? But again, even if I come up with uh, a strong signal absorption, I still have to contend with the timing of it, which is set by astrophysics, we think. Maybe this is all just systematics or foreground, okay? <laughs> um, and I've, I've, I've popped out this galaxy formation wedge, um, well, because it's what I work on and I think it's very important, but also because it's attached to all these other wedges in some way. So if you really wanna you know, think you're constraining some of these processes, you're kind of implicitly marginalized over, over this to the extent that you, to, to the extent that that's possible. 
Um, so in the last part of my talk, I want to focus on this part of the problem. All right. So do vanilla galaxy formation models do the trick? Is that part of the problem solved? Um, so to start with, I will show you uh, kind of a generic prediction over the last 10 or 15 years, I would say, in blue, which is unfortunately placed uh, in, the, in the right sort of frequency range. So if you went and downloaded the code I use that I've written to do these models or somebody else's, the default set of parameters is likely to give you a signal that looks like this, um, which is unfortunate because it gives you the, the impression that the only problem we have to solve is this amplitude problem. Um, so now I want to try to convince you that uh, these expectations were sort of biased uh, by the time in which they were created. Um, so a, a key assumption in a lot of these models is that the efficiency of star formation is just a number. Right? Um, so we know that that's not the case now. Uh, if you look at, say, high redshift galaxy luminosity functions that probe the rest frame ultraviolet uh, part of the spectrum, um, the luminosity functions uh, have a shape that's different than the halo mass function, which suggests that galaxies of different masses form stars with different efficiencies. Right? So if you then build one of these models uh, with a flexible functional form for the efficiency of star formation, uh, and you match onto luminosity functions, which is what we did a couple years before the edges result came out, you come up with this new prediction that you would actually expect a signal to occur at something like redshift 12 uh, between 100 and 110 megahertz. And it's this big, broad uh, profile. Um, so at the time, we thought this was really great um, because the signal is deeper than the expectations. And actually, at the time, nobody was really, people were just starting to operate at frequencies below 100 megahertz. Okay, so like edges, incarnation one, and some of the other experiments were probing 100 megahertz and higher, which is tough for the first 10 megahertz due to the FM band, depending on where you're observing from. But this was sort of on the edge of the FM band. So we thought, oh, maybe we could rule out models like this. Um, and so people have been trying to do that. Um, but if you, start, if, you, if you use this as a starting point for understanding the edges measurement, and you just put in by hand some excess cooling that gives you a signal that's quite deep, you still have a timing problem, um, which is to say that by you know, bringing in some exotic coolant, uh, you're not simultaneously in some magical way solving, uh, changing the timing of the signal that much. That's uh, being dominated by astrophysics. So this might not seem like a lot of time. Uh, this is a few hundred million years, but when we're talking about a whole slew of events that happened less than a gig year after the Big Bang, this is a substantial fraction of the Hubble time. Okay, so I think it's worth thinking about, and you'll see in a second more uh, why that is. Uh, so once again, you can start to try to play some games uh, to reconcile these measurements. So again, I've got the UV luminosity functions on the left here. Uh, I'm sorry, for, for those of you not familiar with luminosity functions, this is magnitudes. Uh, and so bright stuff is over here, and it's rare. So this is just essentially a histogram, so number of galaxies per unit volume. So rare stuff is bright, it's over here. Faint stuff is abundant, and it's over here. So I can say, well, I've got this model where the star formation efficiency doesn't need to evolve with time, but what if I did? Uh, what if it did? How much wiggle room is there to accommodate uh, edges without breaking the luminosity functions, right? And. So I play a little movie once again. If I allow star formation to become more efficient at earlier times for some so far unspecified reason, I can push the global 21 centimeter signal to earlier times, lower frequencies. But if that evolution continues for very long, I run into problems with the luminosity functions on the left. Okay. Um, so I can say, well, maybe it's not the, the time evolution uh, that's important here. Maybe it's the shape of the star formation efficiency curve itself, we're, like I mentioned very early on, biased towards only bright sources at high redshifts. So maybe something fundamental changes only in the faint galaxies before reionization. Um, and so the way we've done this here is just to say that maybe there's a floor in the efficiency of star formation. Um, and once again, I can dial that up uh, to make features appear in the global 21 centimeter signal earlier, but at the same time, I pretty quickly run into trouble with luminosity functions. 
Um, and notice that even in, in the places where this, the kind of peak of the signal lines up with the edge of signal, we still have got a, a big shape problem, which I'll come back to. So these movies are just for illustrative purposes. Um, what we actually did is we just parameterized the efficiency of star formation with some flexible function. And then we fit simultaneously all the high redshift luminosity functions that are out, out there right now and the edges signal and asked, what does this function have to look like and how does it have to evolve with time to simultaneously match all sets of observations? Okay, so what you're seeing here uh, from left to right is this efficiency of star formation as a function of dark matter halo mass. Uh, I'm going to skip this for the interest of time. And then the, uh, the so-called Medal plot, so the uh, co-moving star formation rate density in a big chunk of the universe as a function of redshift. Um, and so if you focus first on the left-hand panel, uh, different colors are different redshifts. And the dotted lines represent a case where you just fit to UV luminosity functions. So this is like the vanilla fit that you'll see in a slew of papers in the last, I don't know, five years, showing this kind of classic double power law-like behavior in the star formation efficiency, which suggests that you know, there's some sweet spot in terms of forming stars most efficiently in halo mass. And the results of our fit are the bands. And so you'll notice this hard break from the standard predictions at about 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is not coincidentally about the limiting, corresponds to the limiting magnitude of current observations. Right. Just something to, to be troubled about. Um, and this, again, may not look like much. We're talking about little galaxies here. But uh, over the whole population, this is not a small effect. So in the Medal plot, uh, again in green here, the standard prediction that of a, of a steeply declining star formation rate density at high redshift. Uh, these new models correspond to about an order of magnitude boost in how much star formation is happening globally at very high redshift. So this is, this is non-trivial. Uh, you might ask, why would such a thing happen? Which is a reasonable question to be asking, and I haven't made a physical case for why this should happen yet. In fact, models, at least at later times, predict the exact opposite of this behavior. As reionization proceeds, star formation in low mass objects is suppressed. Um, basically because they can't hang on to, to their gas. Um, but who knows? Maybe this happens at early times and then reionization shuts this off. I don't know. Um, you probably have your own ideas about what could be causing this. Um, a number of things come to mind. Uh, couldn't the edge of signal be a signature of POP3 star formation? Maybe efficient accretion onto the first black holes. Globular clusters we know are old. They've got to be forming sometime around here. Maybe our expectations are just biased. Right? Uh, we've matched on to high redshift luminosity functions that are not free of their own problems. Um, so perhaps you know, our, our expectations are just off and we actually don't need a new source population. Something completely different um, that we haven't thought of yet. And the answer is maybe. A lot of people are thinking about these things, including myself. Um, but the thing I like about this kind of phenomenological star formation efficiency model is that it makes predictions that are readily testable. Right. Whereas I think a lot of these things you can kind of fit for the parameters of the models to your heart's content without running into problems elsewhere, um, which is problematic. So to convince you of this, um, I'll show you a forecast for number counts for James Webb Space Telescope ultra deep fields. So all I've done here is taken my luminosity functions as a function of redshift and asked what's the surface density of those galaxies as a function of redshift? So this is essentially number of galaxies brighter than the corresponding apparent magnitude per square degree in some delta Z interval of one, uh, going from low redshift, redshift eight in green, out to redshift 15 in, in red. And once again, these dotted curves are the answers you get when um, you just consider UV luminosity functions and extrapolate. You basically assume there's no feature in the star formation efficiency or time evolution. Um, and so then you can compare to a number of survey strategies. Um, these are just kind of proposed survey strategies right now uh, since James Webb hasn't flown yet. But if you just look at the ultra deep case, uh, so this is a, a strategy where you uh, go as deep as possible on the smallest possible area. So you're insensitive to the rare uh, Galaxy, bright galaxies, which sets this kind of horizontal line, and then your sensitivity is limited 
as indicated by this, this vertical line. And what you'll notice, so basically, uh, when the curves lie up and to the left of these, these lines, that means you can detect those objects. What you'll notice is that at redshift 15, if the current measurements of the luminosity functions are right and our extrapolations are reasonable, you wouldn't actually expect to see anything at all, even in a James Webb ultra deep field. Uh, but if these phenomenological models are right, uh, we should see something. All right. And the same is basically true at redshift 12 and a little bit at redshift 10. We expect to see galaxies at those redshifts no matter what, um, but the number counts, if we see about 10 times more than we're expecting um, at those redshifts, then this model is not completely crazy. Um, and I still haven't told you why this happens, but in this sort of semi-empirical modeling framework, that's, this is the observation that can rule it out. Right? So if James Webb flies, it does its ultra deep field, and it sees nothing at redshift 15, this model is wrong. Uh, which either means edges is wrong or we need fainter, fainter stuff uh, or x-ray sources to kind of pick up the slack for us. So this is likely to happen first, James Webb flies or follow up experiment? Um, <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, so edges has been going on the longest of the global signal experiments, so they're kind of the most experienced. Ceres and Prism are working hard, and they're just younger, so they're going through, kind of working through systematics and that sort of thing. I think the most compelling thing would be if like Hera saw it in a completely different observable, um, and, and they're building out rapidly as well. And so, so it's hard to estimate because I'm a theorist and uh, I don't have a good appreciation for uh, how hard these things actually are. <laughs> uh, but I gather that they're hard. And so it's hard to predict when uh, people will have all these systematics figured out. But I don't think it's unreasonable. That was a long preamble. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect some, some semblance of closure to this on like five year time scales. But that, you know, hopefully James Webb has launched successfully well before the five year mark, right? So, um, and with that horribly unsatisfactory answer, I will get to my final two slides, which gets back to this issue about the shape of the signal. Um, so I've just been telling you about the astrophysical piece of this puzzle for the last little bit here. I've swept under the rug the bit about uh, having to make the signal very strong. Uh, we did this in two different ways um, in our paper. Rather than invoking some particular dark matter model, we just parameterized the thermal history after recombination and fit for what it had to be to make this all work. So we didn't attribute that cooling to anything in particular. We also concocted an astrophysics only model where the low frequency background is tied to uh, stars and galaxies themselves. Um, and we just fit um, for everything. And you'll notice that our kind of reconstructed signals in these fits, we can get the trough location okay, but the, the shape of the signal is pretty wonky. Um, and so that's not the only problem. Um, so the shape is off. Each of these classes of models uh, have their own problem. So if we just, yeah, so if we first focus on this radio background model, the first thing we did is to say, let's imagine that star forming galaxies emit low frequency radio photons like nearby galaxies do. There are known empirical correlations between star formation rate and radio luminosity, which makes sense. Um, these photons are produced in star forming regions and uh, supernova remnants. But let's just fit for the normalization of that empirical scaling. So we're sweeping all our ignorance into some free parameter. Um, and then we can fit for what that has to be so that we get enough radio emission to make this work. And so when we first did this, we got the gray curve here. That's our, uh, say, but quote unquote, best fitting model, which isn't great. And the other uncomfortable thing about that is that the required normalization and these laws between radio emission and star formation rate is something like a thousand times the local value. Right, this is a hard problem getting that much radio emission that early. Right, there's not a lot of star formation yet. You need, a, you need this to be efficient. And the other thing is we imposed a prior, kind of a, an optimistic prior that we can use all of the arcade 2 excess to make this happen for us. So of course, by construction, we run into that. The more radio emission, the better. So then we said, OK, well, what if this mysterious radio emission comes to a close quite rapidly? We can just introduce another free parameter and fit for when it has to turn off. And again, not coincidentally, it has to turn off uh, right around the time of the edges signal. So for the reason for that, if you think about this gray curve again, um, I'm essentially amplifying the backlight uh, of this, this 1D transfer problem. And if that's tied to star formation, that star formation is continually rising with time. So I'm making the, the backlight brighter and brighter. And what that's doing is it's trying to make the signal as, as deep as possible. 
Uh, so it's the, the radio emission is trying to make the signal go like this. Uh, the heating from astrophysical sources is trying to make the signal go like back up towards emission. And so basically the introduction of this, this new radio background uh, makes it even harder for the x-rays to drive the signal back into emission, right? Unless you turn off the radio emission, um, which you can of course do, but um, who knows how physically meaningful that is. Um, so the last thing I want to point out here is that if you go the other route um, and you say there is some exotic coolant in the early universe, um, so something that's been done so far to interpret these measurements is to say, well, um, I have a measurement of the brightness temperature. It's a half Kelvin at redshift 18. If I assume that the Waudhausen field coupling is complete and that like the spin temperature is exactly the kinetic temperature, I can take a measurement of the brightness temperature and I can infer the gas temperature, the gas kinetic temperature, right? And then I'm basically trying to come up with that gas temperature in, in my, my dark matter model. The problem is, um, if you go and look at a bunch of models, this Vauthausen field coupling takes time. Okay, you have to build the UV background, which doesn't occur instantaneously. So if you just look at these models, uh, if you look at the spin temperature evolution with time and the kinetic temperature as a function of time, uh, usually when the signal peaks, that process is not yet complete. That means you're overestimating the kinetic temperature by perhaps a factor of two. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that the kinetic temperature has been heated by sources at this time as well, which means there's, there are two reasons why you could be overestimating the temperature. Okay, so that means if, you, if you're leaning on the kinetic temperature to amplify the signal, it's probably lower by a factor of two or four than you would have naively expected, which means you need more strongly interacting particles. And more strongly interacting particles are the ones that run into problems with external constraints. Right? So this hasn't been done, I would say, uh, fully self-consistently yet. Usually in the dark matter models, people are just asking a simple question of how do I make the gas two Kelvin at redshift 17 instead of you know, eight Kelvin or whatever it is. Um, but really you have to make it something like a Kelvin. Right, which is pretty tricky. Okay, so on that very cheery note, I will just um, put up my conclusions. And despite all the complexities with uh, interpreting the edges signal, it's been an exciting time. And I think there are reasons to be hopeful in the next few years that we can get to the bottom of this and uh, figure out what's going on. So thanks for your attention. Um, I think it's what happens in low mass things. Basically all of our like feedback models, stellar population models and so forth are based on things that live in halos at least 10 to the 10 solar masses. And uh, what extent does that depend on stars versus black holes? So you can play black hole masks, uh, you can play black, black hole games as well. Um, and there will be a paper out on archive later this week about this actually. I'm not on it. Um, and Okay, I could answer this in a lot of ways, but I think, so just from star formation, it's hard because the feedback processes are all different. We, know, we don't know what pop three stars are like, um, and we don't really know how stuff in these shallow potential wells responds when it's hit with some incident radiation field. Um, the black hole thing is hard too because, so you, so you have to make black holes very efficiently. We, we know that at least some black holes have to grow efficiently just from independent observations, but then. I see. Uh, abstracts of talks by Jenny Green's group. I have not seen a paper arguing that 10% of the fourth galaxies have a gen. So suppose 10% of the fourth galaxies have about 10 to 5 solar mass black hole. So, so, so it helps. Um, right, so the shape of the signal is very informative. Um, you can think of the slope of the signal here as being related to the heating rate density. So black holes could help you there. It depends on the rate at which they're forming. Um, what's nice is that black holes grow exponentially. So even if they're growing at a rate that's similar to the star formation rate density that doesn't give you signal sharp enough, in time, because they're growing exponentially, you could actually get more rapid heating than you would not even expect. But then you run into the same problem that the radio background has, which is you kind of need that to turn off at some point, because otherwise you're going to break the X-ray background, you're going to reionize too early, or you're going to come up with way too much black hole mass density at redshift six. 
And you can, of course, like solve all of these problems by putting free parameters in your model to like make everything work out just right. Um, I think you also need them to be heavily obscured. Yeah, that would get around that. Yeah, that would get around some of the like some of the problems because you can't have them heat too much, right? Because you still need the, need the iGEM to be cold. Um, some local gas. Well, you need, you need neutral gas or metals. Metals, yeah. Metals would be great, but that's hard too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's tricky. Uh, if, if the, so I will say, I mean, we might be reading too much into the shape of the signal. There are uncertainties here, and of course, the the recovered shape that they get is determined by the model they've chosen to parameterize the signal. So there could be slightly different shapes that like are also fine and kind of alleviate some of this tension. Um, certainly like the flat bottom of the signal, like nobody can come up with. We, we have some models that kind of get there, but there's, it's kind of a fine tuning issue. Um, yeah. I guess I have one. So one of your slides you mentioned the bubble and the clusters. Yeah. So I have a student working on this. Um, so the motivation for this was basically that in uh, like the frontier fields recently, there have been claims that some galaxies detected at very high redshift are the size of single stellar complexes, like 10 parsec or something. Apart from that, we just know that globular clusters have, so at least some of them have to form during this epoch. So the game we're playing is to say, let's imagine the galaxy model is all fine <laughs> um, and that that extra star formation is coming from globular clusters what's their formation rate history? What does it have to be to make this work? And for models where you fit edges with globular clusters, what's the sort of contamination fraction in high redshift luminosity functions? Like in a given MUV bin, what fraction of those objects would you expect to be like globular clusters? Because that's testable too, right? And so don't scoot me, anybody. Um, that will be forthcoming. And I think the answer is, you know, if, if that's the explanation you lean on, uh, something like 10% or 20% of high redshift galaxies are actually globular clusters. Um, yeah. Okay. Any last questions? If not, I will take Jordan back for dinner tonight. So if you're interested in joining, let me know. And we'll have cookies upstairs in the lounge room from the chat board. That's time, Jordan, again. Thanks.